So what I want to do today is actually to invite you into a reflection on those two readings that we read. We didn't read the Hebrews reading, and if you want to see what I did with that, you can go and watch the video from, um, from last Sunday's sermon, which is on the website. But I want to just focus in on the um, first reading and then the second reading. And so I want to start with the book of Job, that passage at least, which is from the book of Job. And I want to say a little bit about the book of Job, which is one of the great spiritual uh, classics of the Western world. That, of course, doesn't mean it's an easy book to read. Just because it's a classic text doesn't mean it's a childish text or an easy book. It's not, it's not inch by inch. It's, it's not sort of, um, it's not one of those, it's not a book produced by the Wiggles. In fact, this is a, an essay, kind of. It's, it's structured as a, as a dialogue between a number of different characters. And, and the, it's actually almost 13,000 words long. So it's a fairly lengthy task which somebody has put together. What they've done is they've got a little bit of story at the front and a little tiny snippet of story at the end, which we'll actually read next week. And in between, there's this series of conversations, mostly between Job and three of his friends who turn up to comfort him. And you probably know the expression, they are just a bunch of Job's comforters. Because the people, the friends who turn up to comfort Job were may, way more interested in validating their own worldview than in standing in solidarity with Job. So what's happened to Job? Well, what the reader knows, because we get to read the introduction, okay, and, and what neither Job nor his visiting friends know, is that God is having a little game with Satan. And that's all mapped out in the first two chapters of the book of Job. And God has said to Satan, I reckon Job's a stinky die, because God always speaks with an Australian accent in this cathedral. I reckon, I reckon that Job fella, I reckon he's dinky die. No matter what you do to him, he will stay loyal to me. And Satan says, you are on. And, and he has permission to destroy every aspect of Job's life except killing him. Let's hope God is not having a game like that with us at any time during our life. But that's the way the book of Job tells the story. So Job loses all of his wealth, one great series of catastrophes. Everything he owns is lost. Then all of his family, all of his adult children are taken away. And then finally his health is taken away and the only person he's left with is his wife his best advice is, why don't you curse God and drop dead? Okay? A great helpmeet indeed in that instance. So three of Job's friends turn up. And as I said, they supposedly come to comfort him, but their idea of comforting Job is to help him realise, from their perspective, how he must be responsible for all the bad stuff which is now happening in his life. He must have done something to deserve this, and if he would just confess it, God would take all these bad things away from him. In other words, they want to put all the blame on Job, and they want to exonerate not only God, but their religion. And they're actually more interested in their religion than in God, let alone Job. And in between each of these guys having their go, and they have three rounds of this, this is beginning to sound like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, okay? It's a story that's been woven and it's working with the symbolic number three. In between each of the comforting statements by his friends, Job protests his innocence, and then another one piles in. Finally, they all finish. And a young whippersnapper turns up who's just out of seminary and he's got all the answers because he's read all the latest theological textbooks. And he actually says, I've been keeping silent because you are so much older and wiser than I am, but you've been useless, so let me have a go at this. 
And he proceeds to tell Job for the next couple of chapters what a terrible person he is and how God is always right. And he just has to acknowledge that he is responsible for his own bad behaviour. And all of that takes up 37 chapters in the book of Job. Okay? If you were joining us for morning and evening prayer the last several weeks, we've been reading that. Night after night after night, we've been reading that stuff. Finally, and it's what we got in that little snippet that Camellia read to us, finally, in chapter 38, God turns up. And he puts everybody in their place, beginning with the Job's friends. And that's what he's saying in that passage. So you think you're so smart. You were there when the world was created, were you? You were there when the morning stars sang and so on. And indeed for the next four chapters, God is just going to talk and talk and talk and talk and put everybody in their place, including Job's friends, and including Job himself. And Job basically ends up by saying, I have nothing more to say. You're God, I'm just a human, and I'm not going to complain. Okay? And it would have been so much better if the book of Job had stopped there. But somebody, probably related to the Deuteronomist, the person mostly responsible for the Old Testament, had to put on a little footnote to say, and because Job was good, he got everything back. How you get your dead children back, I'm not sure, but he got extra children. Like you need that when you're 96, okay? You need more babies coming into the family. Um, so the, the best we'll read next week is that Job gets everything back. He gets a new family, he gets all his friends back, all his cousins that have disappeared all come back. That's funny how that happens. And he gets all his farms and all his animals and he's prosperous and he lives happily ever after. I wish that last bit had never been tacked on to the book of Job because the point of the book of Job is that the only answer to suffering is God knows. We don't. And our part is to be faithful to God, even in the time of suffering. And, the, and so there's this incredible, um, powerful text there in the, in the very heart of the Jewish and Christian Bible. And then we have the Gospel reading. So just very briefly, because I've already talked long enough probably for one sermon, we get this sad kind of scene where Two of Jesus in a circle. You normally hear about Peter, James, and John. Well, this is James and John coming up, trying to elbow Peter out of the way and say, so when this all works out the way we all want it to work out, we want the top jobs in the kingdom. And guess what? The other 10 were not impressed. Now, the church has never had difficulties. The church has never had conflict. The church has never had struggles. Has it ever again? Certainly not in this parish, I'm sure. But you know, we can see what's going on there. And notice how Jesus deals with it. And it's that beautiful passage towards the end of, of um, Mark um, that we just read. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. And this is the punchline. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Now, I've actually led a, uh, an ordination retreat for people who were being ordained deacon many years ago in Wallachra Diocese. And, and we, we spent a lot of time looking at all the places in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, where the Greek word diakonia um, is used, which is the word deacon, basically. And what we actually have there in the Greek is Jesus says, the Son of Man came not to be deaconed, but to deacon. Okay, we translate it as serve. But Jesus actually said, I haven't come for you all to be deacons to me. I have come so that I can be a deacon to everyone. 
And so we've got, in a sense, two sides of a very valuable coin, we might say. In the Old Testament reading from Job, we're being asked to recognise the otherness of God, the faraway God, the God we can never figure out. Okay? The God in the phrase, God knows. And in the Gospel, we have the God who comes alongside us with no airs and graces and who says, I've come, because that's what son of man means, I have come, this fellow here, this son of Adam, I have come not to be deaconed, not to have you run around doing jobs for me, but I have come to be a deacon and to give my life as a ransom for many. The magic, the majestic and faraway God is the God in Christ who comes among us as one of us and invites us to walk his way. Amen. So let's turn to the prayers, which are actually in the very middle of your service book, where the staple is.